Hi there. So I wanted to give you guys a little overview of my personal history just as a sort of first step to getting to know each other. So I have some notes here. I am not a videographer. I hope I will get better at this, but um, I'm going to do my best. <laughs> So, starting from the beginning, I was born in Kansas in a very small town. My dad was a farmer and my mother was from New Jersey and um, while my dad was alive, she was a housewife. She had studied art and she came from a family of musicians. and. Um, she, I think, wanted to be a veterinarian at the time that she went to college, so she ended up going to K-State University, far away from her home in New Jersey, because it was the only university at the time that accepted women into the veterinary program. And she met my father there, and they got married. And then five years later, they had me, and... Um, and then when I was four years old, my father died in a car accident. He passed out while he was driving. He was drunk, he passed out, and he drove off of a bridge. And um, he was thrown from the vehicle and he died. And that was around Christmas time. It was actually December 21st. So my grandparents flew out and they had the funeral on the 23rd. My grandparents flew back to New Jersey <laughs> and then flew back out again for Christmas so that we wouldn't notice that it was near Christmas when my dad died. And that actually succeeded to a great degree because I did not realize that he died so close to Christmas until I was in my 30s. <laughs> anyway, <clears throat> um, so I have a younger brother and his name is, well, I have a younger brother. He's two years younger than me. And uh, when I was six, my mother remarried. And uh, in that deal, I got two older stepbrothers. And we are family. <laughs> in spite of the fact that my mother actually got divorced uh, from my stepfather when I was 17. So... Um, I started doing music and dance classes very young. I started piano when I was six. I had previously studied a little bit of violin with my mother, but she decided she didn't want to teach me because her father had been her piano teacher and she felt it impacted their relationship negatively. So um, she didn't want to teach me violin. And so as soon as I was big enough to start playing the piano, I started piano lessons with another teacher. And I had studied, I started, um, sorry, before that, actually, when I was four, I started ballet classes. And that was because I was pigeon-toed as a child. And uh, the doctor suggested that dance classes might help me. Later on, I also was um, suspected to have scoliosis. And so I was, that was another reason to keep me in dance classes. I developed a real love of dance. I, of course, always loved music, but I kind of took it for granted because of the fact that my grandfather was a concert pipe organist and my grandmother was a working um, operatic soprano. And so I just never really considered it as a career, to be honest. I, I really was passionate about dance. I watched musicals constantly. And um, by the time that I was 13, I was taking 10 classes a week. I was working as an assistant for my dance teacher. And then I also had still piano lessons and I was playing French horn. And um, I, was, I was a busy teenager. Um, at that time, I also, uh, through a series of events, ended up having some IQ testing and at the same time they gave me some personality testing and discovered that I was um, suffering from very low self-esteem and they don't really diagnose children with depression but I was 
definitely depressed. I was ostracized by my peers and um, I was made fun of for my interest in dance. I think probably a lot of the people in my community felt like I was a little too good for myself, you know, and, um, and they may be right. I, you know, <laughs> who knows? Um, but I was, um, very lonely and I was very unhappy. I was unhappy with my stepfather, um, as a parent. I was unhappy at home. I was unhappy at school. And so I was pretty desperate to get out of my situation and I convinced my mother over the course of a couple of years to let me go away to study dance in a proper school because really the the teaching that I was receiving while it was very well intentioned was not a very high quality of dance instruction. So I auditioned for a program that I was told about by a teacher's wife, this teacher I had met at a dance convention. His wife had studied under this teacher and so this teacher was recommended to me and it was in Fort Worth, Texas. And so I auditioned for his school, um, for his summer program really. Um, but also for his school, and I was given an acceptance, um, which was really quite generous, because I was not a very good dancer. I had terrible technique, I had bad training, and um, I think I was given a conditional acceptance just because I wanted it so badly, and it was clear that I was willing to keep working. I had, we had the audition on Saturday and I was a disaster. I mean, I, I was a disaster. <laughs> I really was. Um, and I was so humiliated and I cried, um, afterward. I was so upset. And then, um, you know, I, I slept on it. I woke up the next day. My mom was ready to take me back home. Um, and I said, no, no, I want to go to the workshop because there was a workshop that he was giving on Sunday. And so I went to the workshop. I was much calmer, much less of a shit show and um, clearly trying very hard and not letting my emotions get the best of me. So um, my teacher, Mr. Viscount, he, uh, he accepted me for the summer program and said that, you know, we would use that summer program that entire summer to determine whether or not I could stay for the rest of the school year. And um, so I went to Fort Worth and uh, studied that summer. It was hard. It was humiliating. I was in the beginner's class. I was the oldest person in a beginner's class. Um, and even that was difficult for me, honestly. But um, I worked very hard. I, um, I worked very hard and I managed to impress Mr. Viscount with my determination and dedication, if not my actual dancing ability. And he said I could stay for the fall semester. So, um, I, so the fall semester looked like this. I would get up in the morning. We would have our academic classes at a performing arts high school. Um, the performing arts high school was separate from Mr. Viscount's school, but we were allowed to take credits from Mr. Viscount's school to that school so that we could do our academics there. And I, I went to this uh, performing arts high school in the morning and I had four classes and then I left at noon with a teacher who kindly drove us from the school to Mr. Viscount's and then I danced from 1 p.m. until 4.30 p.m. We had a, a technique class that was an hour and a half. We had a point class and then we had a variations class where we learned classical variations in class. And um, 
So, and then we would have a break from 4.30 to 5.45 for dinner. And then we would have another technique class from 5.45 to 7.15. And then a rehearsal from 7.15 to 9 or 9.30. Um, and then I would go back to the dormitory. I would do my homework if I hadn't already done it. And I would go to bed because we had to be in bed by 10 p.m. theoretically. I mean... It was, it was rough. It was a lot of dancing and we had class on Saturday as well from 9 to 12.30 and then we were taken to do laundry at a public laundry mat and so um, that's what I did for high school for two years and after two years uh, Mr. Viscount's school was having some financial problems because the Air Force Base and General Dynamics had shut down or reduced staff or entirely for general dynamics and um, a lot of those children were no longer able to a lot of those children were no longer able to afford classes so uh, mr viscount started taking positions out of town i still needed to continue to study so i went with him to these places um, so the next year I went to Las Vegas for the first semester where he was an artist in residence at the University of Las Vegas. And then in the spring semester, I went to Argentina. He left me in the city of Buenos Aires and then he went out to the Pampas to teach. I stayed there, I studied at the Teatro du Colón and then we met up again in a few months and we went to Brazil for a couple of months. And uh, then we came back, we had the summer workshops and whatnot. Um, so I traveled a lot and I spent a lot of time reading, um, but I, I completely disconnected from music because I didn't have access to a piano on a regular basis. Um, I, I was still very interested in pop music and I listened to a lot of music, but I was really just doing dance. Um, the next year I went to study at Joffrey Ballet where I was a trainee and then I went to the Milwaukee Ballet to train and um, and then I should back up a little bit. So um, during my first year of school at Mr. Viscount's school a roommate of mine introduced me to laxatives as a dietary aid <laughs> and um, I developed an eating disorder at first it was just I would use them here or there to help me lose weight before a performance but um, over the years it, it got worse and um, by the time that I was at um, by the time that I was in Milwaukee, I was having a, a very hard time dancing um, because of the degree to which I was engaging with my eating disorder. I had a hard time going to classes um, because I was busy binging and purging. <laughs> and um, I, I became very depressed, I'm guessing. Um, I ended up leaving Milwaukee Ballet because I was unable to get out of bed. Essentially, I, I was sleeping 16 hours a day or so. I didn't know what was wrong with me. I felt awful. Of course, I did not even think that it might be because I had an eating disorder or anything like that. But I moved back home to Kansas and uh, my eating disorder there was not improved. I had test after test to see what might be making me so tired. I was tested for everything. Muscular dystrophy, multiple sclerosis, HIV, <laughs> you name it. They, they didn't find anything wrong with me, so what they did was put me on the pill, <laughs> which made me gain a shit ton of weight really quickly. Did not help with the eating disorder. Um, and during the time that I was in Kansas, I went ahead and enrolled in college. I had taken my GED, um, 
over Christmas one year because I wasn't able to keep up in my classes while I was traveling with Mr. Viscount. And um, so I just decided to go to college while I was trying to figure out what to do next. Um, at a certain point, it became apparent why I left Kansas. <laughs> Very apparent why I left Kansas in the first place. And um, I didn't have anywhere else to go. I didn't know what I wanted to do with myself. And so I ended up moving to an ashram in Virginia called Yogaville. Um, Yogaville is, uh, well, an ashram, for those of you who don't know, is a spiritual community uh, usually centered around Hinduism or yoga. The ashram I went to is an ecumenical ashram. They accept all religions. They um, encourage people to stick with whatever they were brought up with. And um, it was it was sort of a almost like a work study program that they had called the Living Yoga Fellowship, or sorry, Living Yoga Trainee. Now I think it's called fellowship, but um, the Living Yoga Trainee, the LYT program, where you live there and you give four hours of labor per day, helping with lunch or vacuuming temples or cleaning bathrooms or whatever. And, um, and then you can, you have your morning yoga class and meditation. You have a noon meditation. You have an afternoon yoga class and meditation and you have your meals and then you had some study that you'd have like a book study um, class or um, a class on breathing exercises and that kind of thing that you could take as an LYT and I was there for a few months and um, that's how I first got connected up with yoga it was my first experience of yoga and it, it was a very positive one. I did not <laughs> stick with the faith that I was brought up in. I, I never really did get along with that faith. We're going to do a separate video on the spirituality stuff in a few weeks here. But um, yeah, I, I really had a very positive experience. But there were a lot of groups coming in and out on the weekends for various programs that they offered, you know, sort of like tourist groups of so people who weren't from the ashram who would be there just for a few days to learn Thai yoga massage or Ayurvedic cooking or something like that. And um, I happened to meet a young man that was very interesting to me that I had a little crush on. <laughs> and um, he invited me out to go for a walk and we went walking and it's just surrounded by um, the Blue Ridge Mountains and trees and forest and just all this nature out there and it was great but um, we went on this walk and he wanted me to start doing some role playing with him that I was really not comfortable with and um, at a certain point he was just pressing it so much that I I just turned around and went back I just left. I, I didn't know what, what more to do. I was tired of being pressured and I went back to my dorm room and it was at that point that I realized that there were no locks <laughs> on any of the doors. I couldn't lock myself in a bathroom. I couldn't lock myself in my own dorm room. Um, there was no way that I could secure myself and I felt very unsafe with this guy. And uh, I called my mom and I was like, I was like on the next bus out of there, to be honest. I, I, I have nothing negative to say about the place. That was totally an overreaction on my part, I'm sure. But I was freaked out and I left. And so, um, you know, I went back to dancing, um, danced, you know, got back in shape, still had some problems with the eating disorder, but was getting better, um, was able to dance to some degree at least. And, um, you know, I kind of had it, I, I wouldn't say my eating disorder was on the mend exactly, but it was in a manageable place for me to continue dancing. Let's put it that way. And so I went to ballet Austin and I danced there and I, that was the third company that I had danced with. And I discovered that 
I didn't, I didn't like it. I didn't like the artistic director. Joffrey Bally, I hadn't felt like I fit there. I didn't feel like I was going to get the attention I needed there because I wasn't really that kind of athletic dancer. I was more of an adagio style dancer. Um, I didn't, you know, I didn't like the other dancers. <laughs> I just, I, I didn't, you know, and I, um, I came to the point where I decided that I was in dance a little bit for the wrong reasons. I had developed a very, um, a very deep attachment to my coach, Mr. Viscount, and um, he was like a father to me, and I felt like I was just dancing to make him proud in a certain way. And uh, so I didn't know what to do again. I, I decided I wasn't going to go back to Ballet Austin. I moved back to Fort Worth. And I, um, I taught ballroom dancing for a few years. And then I went back to college and I got my degree. And, uh, but anyway, so backing up a little bit. Um, so when I came back from Austin and I wasn't sure what I was doing with myself and I just started, I don't even know if it was before or right before I started teaching ballroom dancing, I might have just stud been studying a little bit of ballroom dancing at the time, but, um, a guy approached me in a, on all night pancake house, an old scraggly looking, <laughs> 60 year old hippie with not so many teeth approached me in an all night pot, uh, approached me in an all night pancake house and uh, asked me if I knew how to sing. And curiously, this was the second time that this same individual had approached me. He, this was my 21st birthday, and um, he had approached me on my 20th birthday as well at the same place before I moved to Austin. I moved to Austin, I turned 21. Oh, sorry, it was my 22nd birthday that he approached me. I turned 21 in Austin, I came back and this guy approached me again and I thought, wow, that's, that's strange. I guess, you know, it being the second time that this random person has come up to me, maybe I should follow this up. And, um, so I went to audition for him, <laughs> audition for him, and uh, met him out in a little suburb in this rundown house, just completely infested with cockroaches <laughs> uh, and a flea infested dog. Um, and I actually ended up joining his band and we were good friends for a very, very long time. Um, anyway, so I started singing with his band. He introduced me to the music scene in Fort Worth and the poetry scene. And I got really involved in that. I, it, it became my life. I had gotten a guitar for my 21st birthday from my mother because I wanted an instrument that I could carry around that would play chords because you can't carry a piano. And so she had given me a guitar and I started learning how to play it. I started slowly writing my own songs while I was singing with Ron's band. And, um, and then I started playing solo gigs. Although I, I, I did resist that for quite a while. I did resist playing my own guitar for myself for a very long time. I thought for a while I, what was going to happen is I was going to like learn. I just write the songs on the guitar, right? I'd figure out the chords so that I could tell somebody else what the chords were and they would play the song for me while I sang. I thought that was going to happen. Don't make that mistake. Play your own instrument, ladies. <laughs> but uh, so. Yeah, so I eventually did learn how to play my own guitar and sing and started playing solo. And then uh, while I was doing that, I was teaching ballroom dancing and then I went to college. I got a degree in 
I got an interdisciplinary degree just to get out of my undergraduate, which was a ridiculously long title. It was um, creative writing with an emphasis on socioeconomic, cultural, ethical, and political issues. So, um, so I did that. I graduated in December of 2001, which if you have any memory, that would be right after September 11th happened. And when I got out of school, there was no way I was getting a job. There just weren't really that many jobs, especially in the liberal arts. And um, so I was dating um, somebody at the time who was going back to college himself, and he was going to college in Denton, which is about 40 miles north of Fort Worth. And I decided I would just go to graduate school in Denton and go with him. Um, not the first time that I made a decision based on a guy, um, but <laughs> probably the last, uh, I mean, at least the last guy that I made a decision for. It's not the last decision I made based on that guy, but uh, last guy I made a decision of my life for. And uh, so anyway, I, I went to school in Denton. I started in political science, which I really enjoyed. I thought I would, you know, do something songwriting with my political knowledge or, you know, maybe work for, I don't know, a campaign or an embassy or something like that. But after a semester of political science, my boyfriend said that I was too cranky and maybe I should try the English department. The political science department did not seem particularly eager to help me stay. And the English department did seem pretty eager to have me as a student. So I decided to apply to their creative writing program and I studied poetry writing. <laughs> money maker, um, studied poetry writing under the direction of Dr. Bruce Bond, who was a pretty well-known poet in the academic arena or in the, you know, if you're into poetry, you've probably heard of him. Um, my name was not Bond at that time. Just a coincidence. Very, very big coincidence. Anyway, so I did that. I graduated. Um, I decided to spend a year teaching in France. So I moved to France and I taught elementary school children there. And that was a great experience. Um, it was hard because there, there was no textbook, there was no syllabus. I had no idea what I was supposed to teach them. And it was difficult to get them to study because the age that I was teaching, you, can't, you don't test them. It, they don't get tested in English until they've gone through three years of English. So um, there's no metric to make them comply with the program you want to give them. But it was a very good experience. My same boyfriend was also there and uh, that was not going well at all. It, it, like that relationship just in general didn't go well at all. We broke up, we got back together, we broke up, we got back together. We broke up while we were in France. We got back together when I got back from France a few months later, and then we broke up again and that was it. Um, but um, yeah, so we, I came back to the United States planning to teach. Um, I took one session of the alternative certification for teachers in Texas and was like, no, I am not doing this. So, um, I got a job and I, I worked in a book bindery. Meanwhile, I'm still playing music, writing music. Um, I started with recording an album with a friend in his home studio. And then I got a job, the book bindery went bankrupt and um, my boss at the book bindery was nice enough to get me a job with her boyfriend who was a lawyer. So I worked for a lawyer as a, like an office assistant, legal secretary, receptionist, cook. <laughs> like, and he had his office in his home. Every Monday we would go and 
buy groceries for the week and then I would make lunches every day and um, it was a great job. It really was. I was really grateful to have it. And at the same time, I, again, was still playing music. And uh, then I decided that I would um, kind of at the suggestion of that same ex-boyfriend, like that's the only, I had a, that boyfriend and then I, you know, dated a few other people and then I got married to my current husband. Um, but uh, at his suggestion, I considered the idea of um, certification in teaching yoga. I went to Bacalar, Mexico with the Integral Yoga, Yogaville Ashram people to do um, my basic 200 hour yoga certification. And that was great. Um, I learned a lot. I am utterly devoted to yoga. I don't know how it managed to stay in my life from the time that I was 18 all the way up to the present, but it is a really big part of my life. And um, I think it was sort of meant to be. So I went and I did the yoga teacher training. I came back, my boss said, you know, I'm not gonna really be able to keep you on um, because, you know, business isn't that great. I don't really need the help and I really can't afford it now. And so um, I had been wanting to move out of Texas for a while and so I moved to Colorado. And I thought I was gonna move to Boulder because, you know, Boulder is the sort of hippy dippy capital of Colorado and I thought that's where I wanted to be and I, I couldn't get there because I it was too expensive. I couldn't find a place to live. Uh, they weren't gonna let me sign a lease unless I could prove income. And I, since I didn't have a job yet, I couldn't prove income. So I stayed in Denver and I'm ecstatic that I did. I, I think I was much better off in Denver. And um, I started teaching yoga classes and um, playing at some open mics and I met my bandmate, Mark, a band. We started Cane and April with just the two of us at first and we played as a duo and it was great. Um, we recorded an album within like the first year that we were playing and then, um, you know, we added a bass player and a drummer. We became Cane and April with the original Sinners and again still great um and oddly my my bandmate mark went to school to college <laughs> with my thesis director bruce bond so we had that in common and then my um then i met my husband and i met my husband because mark was my husband's high school English teacher. And so I met him at a show that we were doing. And, um, well, actually first I met him at, um, at a bar where he happened to run into us, my bandmate and I out and they decided to go to a movie together. And it, you know, beforehand, before the movie started, we just sat around drinking, but I did not realize that was the same person at first because I was really drunk. And <laughs> um, but anyway, so eventually I met him at a show a few times and we, I'll, I'll tell that story. It deserves its own thing, but I'll tell that story some other time. Anyway, so, um, Meanwhile, we had the, the band, got married, the band fell apart right after I got married. I don't know exactly what happened, but the band was no longer. I went around saying, I don't know if I'm in a band because I, I really did feel very abandoned by my band after I got married. So, um... Uh, my husband and I had a social life that consisted almost exclusively of hanging out in a, our local bar and 
I drank more and more and more and I finally got to the point where I felt like I had a problem. It was getting, it was never as bad as the worst of my eating disorder, but it was certainly negatively impacting my life. I wasn't meeting other people, I wasn't creating much, and um, and I was really depressed. I was depressed to the point that I considered suicide, which I had not considered in over a decade. Um, and I realized that if I let it go, it was going to kill me. Either I was going to kill myself or I was just going to die from it. So um, I went to AA. And lo and behold, I, I ran into my family. <laughs> and uh, we started playing together again under the band name The Unquiet Grave. And, but he just didn't really, he didn't really seem that into it. He had other things on his plate. He had a job and I mean, I had a job too, but I was, I was really still dedicated to making music my career and my bandmate was in a different place in his life and he did not seem to be that into it. So I started playing a lot solo. I had been teaching the same yoga class for about, I don't know, six years at that point. And, you know, in our style of yoga, we do chanting at the beginning and the end of class. And some of my students had commented that they would like to have a recording of me to, to do their chant with. And so that kind of put the idea in my head that maybe I would record an album of mantra because kirtan was always my absolute favorite thing to do at the ashram. And at teacher training and everything, like, um, I went to a silent retreat at the ashram one time and they told me I was allowed to sing. I just wasn't allowed to talk. <laughs> so I sang the whole time. Um, and I thought, well, what, what better thing than to combine music and, and yoga? This is great. So I um, started writing compositions for Mantra and I put out my first album back in 2016. And uh, you know, I still have great affection for that album. Although there are probably some foibles and I'm, I probably still have some foibles in, in my presentation. Maybe my pronunciation isn't spot on all the time. I hope I don't offend people. Um, I am very, very sincere though. You know, I, I am very sincere and I, I was lucky to have a, a, an Indian friend in uh, Denver who helped me with my wedding because we had, my husband and I had a Vedic ceremony because I really wanted a Vedic ceremony. <laughs> and uh, so I met this woman that helped me and she became a very good friend of mine. Um, sadly, she passed of alcoholism a couple of years ago, but um, she would help me with pronunciation and translating and I, I really miss having that. So if any of you are any good at that, you know, please comment or, you know, let me know if anybody wants to be a resource for me on the Sanskrit um, front, on the mantra front, because I, I could use it. Um, so it's, uh, you know, you may know that it's gotten, you may know that it's gotten pretty expensive to live in Denver. Um, you know, people blame it on various things, whether it's the, uh, legalization of marijuana or the, uh, just <laughs> the developers or whatever, but it, it became very expensive to live in Denver. And, uh, my mother lives in Florida. She lives in Key West. So I wanted to be closer to her and I wanted to live someplace that I could at least have a shot at making music my livelihood. And I didn't feel like that was possible in Colorado. 
in addition to the fact that the um, that it's so expensive to live in Denver and that whole area, it's also far from everything. Like if you wanted to go on tour, your next stop after Denver is like Salt Lake City or something, right? The next big, big city, it's far. So um, that means hotels all the time. And whereas, you know, on a coast, you can just kind of 15 minutes away to your next gig, you know, you can just walk your way up the coast. So we moved here to Florida. Um, we first moved to Sarasota and then, you know, <laughs> two months after we got there, we've got locked down for COVID. <laughs> and so I haven't made a lot of headway here in Florida yet in terms of the live performances, but I did uh, spend the pandemic doing a great recording project. I've just put out an album of Debbie mantra, goddess related mantra, uh, just a few months ago. And I'm very proud of that. If you want to check it out, it is um, at Bandcamp under April Bond. And um, there are eight Debbie mantras. And then there's a bonus track that is a 10 minute Hadi Om. I don't know, orchestration. I mean, it's, it's a big, it's a big production. It's like got a prelude and all that, but uh, it's actually the, uh, the producer's favorite track is the bonus track. So check that out. You can listen to it two or three times before you have to actually make any kind of a purchase. Um, it's also on Spotify and all of that kind of stuff. But anyway, so that brings us up to date. That's where we are now. I've been, you know, married for 10 years. I have my three lovely cats that I'm sure you guys will meet sooner or later. And um, we just bought a home in Safety Harbor, Florida, which is um, in the Clearwater, St. Pete area, Tampa area. And we love our location. Um, we still haven't gotten to explore it as much as we'd like to because of the variants and the fact that Florida is not really doing a great job at containing the pandemic. But uh, here we are and I am really looking forward to getting to know you guys and I would love to hear anything that you'd like to share with me. And um, I'm going to try to put some pictures and interesting stuff in here, but again, I am not a filmmaker and just be patient with me. I will get better at this, I promise. <laughs> so that's all for now. I will see you soon.